Hello and welcome and thank you for joining us on this, the uh, last conference of this, the last session of this amazing conference. My name is Jamie Hartzell. I'm the chair of the Real Farming Trust, the charity that brings you this conference. And I've got the great pleasure of guiding us all through the next hour. Um, in this last session of what has been a truly outstanding conference, I feel, uh, we'll be looking forward, looking forward into the future. And we'll be asking some challenging questions. What kind of future can we look forward to? Do we have reasons to be hopeful? And is it foolish or even irresponsible to imagine a future world radically better than our own? To set the scene, we're going to first present the truly stunning eight minute animated film, A Message from the Future 2, The Years of Repair. Uh, then for our discussion, I'm proud to, to welcome two makers of the film, Nimmo Bassi and Naomi Klein, both highly regarded activists in their own right and seemingly tireless advocates for social and environmental justice. Really, they need little introduction, but just to bring you up to speed, Nimmo Bassi, uh, currently in uh, Benin City in Nigeria, is executive director of the Health of Mother Earth Foundation, coordinator of Oil Watch International, and has for many years been a leading voice in Friends of the, of the Earth, both in Nigeria and internationally. And Naomi Klein will most likely be known to you for her journalism and as author of bestsellers such as No Logo, The Shock Do Doctrine, This Changes Everything, No Is Not Enough and On Fire. And she's also chair in media, culture and feminist studies at Rutgers University and co-founder of the climate justice organization, The Leap. But the discussion that will be follow the film will be led by you. So please do feed your questions into our panel. Use the ask a question button at the bottom center of your screen. Don't use the chat function to ask questions as this will only be seen by the delegates and not the panelists. But Nimo, Naomi, before we launch the film, can you tell us a little bit about why you made it and what you were hoping to achieve? Nimo. Well, um, I think we have a hard time looking into the future. And I was personally excited when I was called to the uh, to make to the production of that short movie uh, by being brought into a situation where we had to look back from the future. I think it's a perspective that we really need and that we don't have most of the time. Uh, this was really very important for me because when you look back from the future, then you can see all the missteps and then see all the bright lights and bright moments where people really work together to bring about change. So I, I, I believe that's what that's, uh, that sums for me the motivation for, for this work. this and, and the previous film as well. Sure. Well, first, I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be in conversation uh, with you, Nemo, and, and you, Jamie, and everybody at the conference. I want to acknowledge um, that I am on the unceded territories of the Chatlish First Nations um, in what is called British Columbia, uh, Canada. Um, and I also, before we watch the film, want to acknowledge the, the fantastic creative team behind it. You will hear uh, Nimmo's um, booming voice and realize that he has a missed career as a voiceover uh, mm. actor. Um, we also hear uh, the voices of the uh, amazing actors, Emma Thompson, uh, Gael Garcia Bernal, um, and also Opal Tometi, one of the founders, co-founders of Black Lives Matter. Um, uh, her family's from Nigeria, um, uh, she lives in the US, uh, and she co-wrote the script with my partner, Avi Lewis, and the beautiful images that we'll see are created by the incredible artist, Molly Crabapple. Um, and, you know, we conceived of this in the, in the darkest days of the, of the pandemic originally, and it was really an exercise that was about dreaming our way out of this moment and imagining Imagining COVID as a teacher is the way I would put it. Um, and that was informed by um, social movements in Puerto Rico uh, after Hurricane Maria, who, who talked about Maria as a teacher, as a harsh teacher, uh, unveiling uh, uh, and revealing pre-existing crises, but also creating a kind of a roadmap for how we change if we learn these lessons. Um, it's not by any means coming out of a spirit of, uh, we know that this future is coming. It's not prophecy. <laughs> we get it if we earn it. And I think that that's the message of the film. 
So it's very much a, a message of hope. Um, well, let, and, let, work, and work, and work. <laughs> and the work we have to do and the challenges we face. Okay, let's, let's have a look at the film and then let's see the description that follows. Looking back, it's hard to believe that we've rebuilt our community from the ground up with our own hands. The first seeds were planted way back in the terror and tenderness of the pandemic. And then change bloomed in the streets, in the fire and struggle of the uprisings. Around here, we'll never forget the day that the last prisoners were released, walking out into the arms of their loved ones. The easy part was finding work. The Community Care Corps was always looking for people in those days, whether for universal family care, burying border walls, or green new public housing going up one pod at a time. Yep, it was a good time for busy hands. Funny, thinking back to the first wave of the pandemic, that's what you really remember. Hands. Washing, scrubbing, disinfecting, washing again, picturing each other's hands, all the hands that had touched whatever we were touching, the hands that packed the box, that picked the tomato, that planted the seed, the hands that stroked the brow, that said goodbye. The hands were us, all of us, that web of hand to hand, Breath-to-breath -breath relationships was a reminder. We are all entangled, making each other sick, keeping each other alive. That was just one of the lessons of COVID-19. It started in the first great pause, when the smog cleared and the rich fled the cities, when poverty dropped its disguise and racist inequality drew the map of the disease. As the roar of the traffic faded, we arose to birdsong and ambulance sirens. The virus showed us what was truly essential. And we learned again and again that so many of us doing essential work were being treated as sacrificial. From nursing homes to detention facilities, meatpacking plants and fulfillment centers, the virus exposed the cruelty of these warehouses of efficiency and profit. Then things got worse. In 2023, super droughts led to mega floods. Locusts carved a path across continents and hyper typhoons drove millions from their homes. COVID-23 raced through storm shelters and refugee camps. Supplies ran out again. Meanwhile, dinosaurs roamed the halls of power, bellowing that more sacrifice was needed. But every time they cranked up that rust, the old machine called economic growth, the cloud of sickness and death grew. And we couldn't breathe. Couldn't breathe from the asthma in our polluted communities, from the smoke of those fires. We couldn't breathe with a knee on our necks in the clouds of tear gas as we shouted, Black Lives Matter. And that is how the virus changed everything. We finally understood that we couldn't keep patching up the same broken systems. We had to build something new. What was needed was a spark. That spark was us. After months of organizing, the viral rent strike was like a starting gun. Then came the essential worker strike. Delivery drivers, street cleaners, and farm workers got together and said, enough. This time, people didn't just clap from their balconies. We flooded into the streets to join together. One of the leaders was Lucy Ella, a young food courier. When a police bullet stole her life, the crowds exploded in size and then exploded again, spreading across borders like a counter virus. The sparks look different in every country as the wildfire strikes leapt across borders. 
economies ground to a halt, this time blockaded by workers. We lost too many young heroes as states brought out the iron fist, but it was no match for the rest feast of solidarity. Soon, authoritarian rulers started to topple like statues and new governments were suddenly nervous about ignoring the streets. We joined hands and pushed further, launching the years of repair. The first step was rebuilding the economy around the core of essential work, food and farming, care for young and old, public health, not to mention the essential labor of the more than human world, the winged pollinators, the leafy oxygen makers. The Full Employment Act made the new priorities clear, and there was a wave of new worker cooperatives in everything from mental health support to public art and tree planting. Many bosses were made redundant. Our information ecology needed tending too, and so we built a digital commons vaccinated it against surveillance and built up our herd immunity to disinformation. Fossil fuels were running on fumes by that point, so we harnessed their final profits to clean up their messes. Whatever we could, we did outdoors. School, theatre, celebrating. At first, because it was safer. Then, because we realised it made us happier. Nobody talked about missing shopping. Anyway, The right to repair movement meant that a lot of stuff got fixed rather than thrown away and replaced. With life moving at a slower pace, we finally had time to look back and we began the most important repair of all, repairing relationships. In colonial countries like the US, Canada, Australia and the UK, those were hard conversations. But truth and reparations commissions helped some of us face the truth about the violent conquests of the past and how they shaped our world. That guided where we repaired and how. It turned out that once we fully funded schools and housing and healthcare, we didn't need those bloated budgets for policing, prisons and war. And ultimately, the flow of money on planet Earth had to be reversed. So the North finally started paying its debts, and the South finally stopped. Around here, the Land Back program began the historic process of returning some of the stolen land to Indigenous jurisdiction. In the process, we remembered how taking care of the Earth lays the ground for taking care of each other. Within just a few years, we could see the bottom of the river again, and it was safe to drink, and fish in its waters. Things aren't perfect, of course. Between mutating viruses and our warming world, there's always new storms headed our way. But when they come, we're ready. With our networks of nurses and neighbors, our small farms and big forests, our systems of care and repair, no one is sacrificed. Everyone is essential. Film. Great, it's absolutely fabulous film. Thank you so much for that film. It's uh, it's uh, such a moving film, and uh, such beautiful artwork at the same time, and and such poetic language used. But at the same time, it's got a really strong and a really coherent and well argued message. At the same time, it's a really informative and well thought through piece. I think it, I think it's amazing. You know, we get we get we're so used to negative dystopian narratives in the media constantly being thrown at us. And it's great to see something more positive, a more utopian vision of what might be achieved. Naomi, can I ask you, what, what, what's been the impact of the film since its release? It's always uh, a little hard to, to know the impact of, uh, of something like this. You know, we hear from a lot of educators um, talking about how they're adding it to their syllabi. Um, you know, we hear from high school teachers who, you know, who are using it as well and, and talking about how sort of hungry their students are 
uh, for, for this kind of material because they are really struggling with grief and anxiety and a lot of what they hear um, especially about the state of the natural world, but you know, also just general uh, political unraveling as well is just so negative and so scary. So to have an image of the future that we're fighting for um, is is really helpful. Um, the the film I think has been viewed around a million times. It happened very very quickly. One thing I should say, and I know that Avi Lewis, who's a co-writer and producer uh, of the film, is 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 joining us on this on this live stream. He's watching. Um, we got it out the day before Donald Trump was diagnosed with COVID. Um, <laughs> so it was like we had this one day where people were like focused on this beautiful future, and then. Um, we were sort of upstaged uh, by a rather large news event, and we've you know been very much in the, it, at least in North America, really in the cycle of um, of the U.S. presidential elections. But one of the things that we talked about um, as a creative team, and I mentioned the members before, but also the the there's also the the people who directed it, uh, um, Kim Bookbinder, Jim Bat, um, but the launch partners that you saw in the last card, right? Um, the groups like uh, um, uh, Global Nurses, uh, United, um, uh, the NDN Collective, uh, the Movement for Black Lives, Greenpeace International, Sunrise. Um, you know, in putting together this partnership and really the vision in the film is not, you know, picked out of thin air. It's, it is the best ideas coming out of every one of these movements, including Via Campesina, you know, at the, at the, at the heart of this gathering here, um, and just threading them together in a story, in a narrative. And I don't think we have enough of that, right? We have a lot of lists of all the things we believe in, but we don't have a lot of stories. Um, and, you know, as we are creatures of stories and we think stories matter. Um, but in, in you know in this in this um, partnership, part of what we were thinking was that this would become particularly useful once we got out of the electoral cycle, at least in in in, in the United States. Um, you know, it is such a horse race, and the stakes are very high. Um, I think one of the things that I talk about. Uh, it, 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 with relation to the film is this slogan that I first heard in Argentina um, after a huge popular, in the midst of a huge popular uprising um, uh, in 2001 and two, which was our dreams don't fit on your ballots. Um, and that was certainly, has certainly been true in the United States, um, you know, with the Joe Biden election and people working really hard to get rid of Donald Trump, but also knowing that with a corporate centrist Democrat on the ticket, um, you know, the, the future we need, the future that can keep us safe was was never on the ballot. And so in a way, I, I my hope for this film is that it kind of now once we you know extract Donald Trump from the White House, that maybe we can say, OK, um, that was just the beginning of fighting for the world that we actually need. So, I mean, it does it does uh, bring together, it does synthesize a lot of the things we all believe in and present them into a coherent uh, vision and view of the future. Do you think there's some hope that under the new uh, US presidency that those ideas will be more adopted and acted upon? Um, I mean, this president, I don't know. I mean, we, we, uh, <laughs> no, I don't think that, that this is Joe Biden's view of the future. Um, I think Joe Biden's view of the future is the past, um, some sort of uh, uh, decrepit nostalgia for, for, for the Obama era um, that, that, that set the stage for Donald Trump. So, uh, but what I do think, and, and, you know, here I would, um, would quote Annie Leonard, the, the executive director of Greenpeace uh, in the U.S., you know, she s said as she was, you know, campaigning for Biden that, that, she, that, that it was about choosing an opponent, you know, not choosing a, a candidate, choosing an opponent. And that's a framing that I think a lot of people in social movements have used. So do I think that a, a, with, with Joe Biden as an opponent, we have better chance of winning these things? Yes, but I think we have to be very clear that he is our opponent. He's not our partner in this. He's not, he's not the solution. And, and Nemo, for you, uh, are you aware that the, the, the films had much impact within the black community? Or I suppose in Africa, it's quite difficult to get these things so easily widely distributed, but has it had much reach? Um, well, 
where I, well, from where I am, the film was very, uh, is still very useful in starting conversations, uh, especially in the social movements and also in communities that we work with. Uh, people really want to, they're looking for spaces to express themselves, spaces to, to have conversations and to build narratives. Uh, because the, a theme that runs through the movie for me uh, is that the way we formulate situations, the way we frame stories, really, really inspire the way what we do, how we act. And so uh, the, the theme of re the years of repair, if you keep talking about year, it means that something has been broken, something is fractured that needs to be repaired. Uh, and, and so in campaigning against transnational corporations, for example, the oil corporations who who are creating more of the problems, the big agribusinesses, those who are promoting agri-toxics, who are bringing pesticides and herbicides, destroying soils, destroying cultures, destroying crops, destroying the food system. Uh, this a narrative really uh, empowers farmers and fisher folks and community people to see, yes, we can actually do something now so that we can look back in the future and see that we were part of the solution. Uh, and so, so it's been very, it's very useful. It's still very useful for conversations, for discussions, for planning, for strategizing. It, it's not the kind of uh, film that you watch and say and laugh or say, "Okay, we are going for re relaxation." No, it's something you watch and then you act. So, uh, to me, this is very inspiring. It's like a never-ending story, and this is this, this this true value of art to me. It's not never art for art's sake. It's not the art for action. Something to do something with. Something to do something about. And uh, this is really um, what I would, I would call is one one thing you can use to instigate positive action. And I do hope that the powers that be in the United States. I mean, I've been watching what's going on in the U.S. I can't speak definitively about that, but we are really worried uh, about some of the things we're seeing there. That people. A whole lot of millions of people de de decide to be deceived and to ignore the reality. Uh, so, so it takes a lot. It will take a lot of jolting to get people back to to the the truth that is that can be accepted as truth, not alternative information, or alternative um, visions of what is going on. I, I don't know how to put it, but uh, what I really see the to me the key uh, the key for using this product is sorry to use that term product to use this story is as one that provides a counter narrative that we so sorely need right now to repair the broken system exactly we need to take back control of the narrative and get it moving in the direction that we believe in i mean there's a comment here from uh, francis who's saying uh, we all have a role as advocates farmers non-farmers activists scientists the retired children Anyone who feels passionately about the needed changes, would you would you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, but you know, sometimes when we, well, we when we say we that those who realize that the system is anti people is anti mother earth, yes, uh, we have a, a lot to do. Uh, we we all have to we, we have, just as we saw on the film, we have to be able to link hands and work in solidarity. It's not a thing that can be done in one corner alone. It's got to be global. And this is why the global movement is so important. We have our stories, and our stories always converge when we talk against injustice, uh, against the, the degradation of the environment, against criminalizing poor farmers, uh, patent on seeds, on life. Uh, uh, you know, all, all these are things that we can fight collectively uh, and win collectively because food production, for example, to me is very basic. I mean, food is culture. This is why it's called agriculture. But we look at agribusiness instead of agriculture. We mm. need the culture. We need the life. We need. We need to. We look at food. Food is smell. It's color. It's taste. It's celebration. It's life. But people want to sell out food as a commodity. Food cannot be a commodity. And so the the repairs we need to do and working with farmers, work consumers, and all that uh, is really really. Uh, we have the platform. Uh, with this kind of story in the background. Yeah, okay, Naomi, we've got a sort of a challenging question here, which is uh, keeping Why it Why do with... I get the challenging ones? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, uh, 
uh, only the first of many. Um, it's keeping it with the agriculture and food theme. Uh, Avi's asking if if navigating the land requires a compass, and this film reflects a desirable direction. What are the other cardinal directions on the compass there? Mm -hmm. You can take that how you like. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it is it is directing us to where we could be um, if we do a lot of work, right? And I think some of those other th those other stages are depicted in the film. And and you know, I'll just pick up on the theme repair, right? That what we called it the, the years of repair, in, in large part because we wanted to be really clear that this is um, not blank slateism, right? You know, I've written a lot about disaster capitalism over the years, um, uh, and and the 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 one of the common themes that you see from people who take this approach to disaster of um, we're going to use, you know, a hurricane or a tsunami or a war, an economic crisis to ram through our agenda. You always hear this phrase, a blank slate, a clean sheet, where, where, where the disaster struck community is imagined really as empty, like a kind of a terra nullius through trauma, through, 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 through crisis. Um, the idea of the years of repair is, as Nimo was saying, it's about starting from a point of recognizing a deep brokenness, right? And I think it's a brokenness that those of us who are part of the global justice movement for, for many years are aware of, but I think for a lot of people, um, this past uh, year has unveiled a lot of brokenness that they maybe weren't attuned to before. Um, and so the, there, there's a spaciousness in the way we're defining repair here, where it is about repairing um, the damage done to the earth, um, it is, and that is, you know, farming is so central to both the breaking and the healing um, and repairing our relationships to each other. And that requires a reckoning and a reparation um, with historical crimes, with historical uh, wrongs um, and repairing our stuff, right? I mean, getting out of this culture of constant um, disposability, treating the, uh, this idea of, of our stuff as a constant blank sheet that we just throw out and restart. Um, we have to reckon with brokenness in order to get to that future pointing place on the, on the, on the compass. So those are a few of the directions within repair um, that, we're, that, that, that we're trying to speak to. Absolutely, absolutely. Or I suppose you could say the film points us north when everything else is headed south, right? That would be a good way of putting it. <laughs> um, uh, so, so Met is asking, uh, one of my big concern is all the knowledge that we in some countries have lost about how to grow food and connect together uh, uh, to build our food systems. And when you see it looking back from, from the future, um, how, do you, how do you imagine that we overcame the challenges of building up knowledges and practice is that enabled a wider population to connect in this way around food systems and learn together when it's so very different from the consumer and cafe latte life that we lead now? Nemo, what do you feel? Um, yeah, it's true that a lot of knowledge is being lost and people have been disconnected from the source of the things that they eat. Um, you know, some people don't know where food it come from even though there are labels on the package but just reading labels on package is not enough to connect with the farmer to connect with the soil to connect to where the food is coming from uh, so um we all have a, a role to play uh in re repairing that that brokenness i think uh, and and this we could do by uh supporting smallholder farmers and really getting to know who's supplying you the fruits that you're eating the 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 vegetables you are eating and buying from the street corner market rather than going to to, to buy things that are shipped thousands of miles from somewhere else. Uh, it, it takes telling stories that show that what we have in our backyard is much more nutritious to our bodies and to the conditions of where we live than things that we don't know where they came from. Uh, things that are not really meant to even uh, be in, in, on our diet. Uh, so it, it takes a lot of looking around, uh, 
uh, getting to to know what is going around us, knowing the farmers, knowing the, those, the producers and those who are selling. Actually getting to smell the soil. During the lockdown, one of the things, lockdown here in Nigeria, one of the things I began to do when I actually I was forced to stay at home was to start a garden. And so I began gardening and keeping, getting to know the plants. Some of the plants, are, some of the things, some of the seeds I actually planted, I couldn't even identify immediately until they grew up before I could say, oh, this is what I planted here. I mean, shame on me. And uh, that happened. <laughs> but uh, I've, I found the connection to gardening, to farming, to having to harvest what I, I grew uh, very enriching. Uh, apart from being nourishing, it, it gave me uh, the, the it, it made me know that really this is what we have to do. And so since then, we've been having a lot of conversations with farmers, uh, having dialogues with farmers, finding out what kind of crops they used to plant in the past, where did they get the seeds from, were they sharing to their neighbors, or were they going to buy from shops? Uh, how could they get, did they get what they produced to the market? Did they see food? Uh, was it like, what was the notion of plantation agriculture, which was brought about, brought about by colonialism and imperialism? Is that where we want to go? Growing things for machines rather than growing for people. Uh, what, where, where have we lost it? Uh, that we don't see that the crops that we have in our backyard are more climate resilient than crops producing the crops seeds producing the, in the laboratory. Uh, so. Asking this kind of question and having conversation with farmers and consumers uh, has been very much the way to ensure that we have the knowledge and to respect the farmers uh, who have shared, um, who have developed and maintained certain species over hundreds and thousands of years. Really getting to respect them and respect the life that the seed represents uh, and not just depend on what big business says this is the best way to grow, that this is size that the, the fruit must be, and this is the color that it must be. You know, we, we really lose a lot by, by not having these conversations with farmers. And I think uh, conferences like the real, like the name real, Oxford Real Farming, what I'm talking about real farming and not just any kind of farming. Real farming, framing the stories, framing lives, giving us hope and really changing things around us. Naomi, do you have thoughts on this? I'm sure you do. It's kind of your area. Well, well, one thing I would just add is that, you know, coming back to this theme of sort of what has been unveiled uh, in this moment, um, you know, we end the film with this slogan uh, um, uh, uh, that no one is sacrificed and everyone is essential. And, and, ev and, and of course, during this period, the people who were treated as disposable before the pandemic have really been treated as sacrificial during it. And you know, one of the largest such groups is farm workers um, in, in, in certainly in North America, um, migrant farm workers who um, are already dealing with absolutely abhorrent conditions, um, forced to work for you know, pitifully low wages, forced to work through wildfires, and now um, forced to work with COVID outbreaks um, on these huge industrial farms um, uh, and, uh, and where they live. And so thinking about, uh, and here, you know, I'm informed um, uh, um, by, by the work of, of people like uh, Gopal Dayaneni, I don't know if he's listening, but, you know, he talks about, uh, and Movement Generation, he talks about, um, the fact that you know farm workers should have rights to the land that they're farming uh, in North America um, and to farm it the way they want to farm it as well, um, because we are seeing what it means to treat farm workers as sacrificial, as disposable in this period. Um, and so, yeah, I would just just add that. There's some really great other questions that are coming up here. There's plenty, yeah, yeah. I mean, Les is asking, you know, the film depicts diverse social groups acting jointly to turn resources into commons to fulfil people's needs. Mm -hmm. Can you give any recent examples of that kind of uh, 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 collective appropriation happening and, and what obstacles have to be overcome? Um, Besides capitalism. Um. Yeah, a little <laughs> challenge there. <laughs> 
Um, there, there are also, also some questions specifically about the digital commons that we talk about in the film, yeah. um, right alongside a food commons and a housing commons. I mean, it's really a framework that you know so many of us have been fighting for, which is rooted in 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 the right to a dignified life and what it takes to to live a dignified life. Um, and and we are certainly seeing around the world what it means to treat information as a commodity. Um, to treat our relationships as 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 sites of data mining um, and 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 the fuel, you know, this phrase, your know, data is the new oil. I mean, what that means is that we are having these communications inside private uh, media companies, for-profit platforms, um, who for whom our uh, the degeneration of our media ecology and our rage is just more data, more engagement. The angrier we are, the more polarized we are, the more we fight, the more we name call, the more hate we sow online, the more data they get uh, and the more money they get. They're able to monetize that. It's not viable, right? And so I think there's very um, interesting work going on around a digital commons, the right to a digital commons, which I see as you know, intimately connected to any other fight we may have, right? Um, if we're not able to communicate with each other, um, if we are inside the enclosures of these digital companies, um, we are, we're, you know, we're, we're so vulnerable, first of all, right? For that, to, to them just pulling the plug uh, on our communications. And our, and our international movements weren't built that way, weren't built inside these enclosures. So I think we need to be, we, we need to do some really rigorous research that shows the extent to which um, these private media companies have been built with our labor, our relationships, uh, our lack of informed consent about the mining of our data, um, publicly funded research, uh, that built the internet itself. And all of this has been enclosed and privatized the way capitalism encloses the commons and all of the profits and benefits are going to a very few number of, of, of tech billionaires. Um, and, and everybody else is just living with the, with the effluent, with the, with the, with the data effluent. And it's, it's, and the stakes of this we're seeing right now in the United States, but we can also see it in Brazil. We can see it in the Philippines. We can see it you know, in so many contexts where uh, the right has come to power using social media. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of challenges there that we need to um, to overcome. So um, uh, do, can, can we just take a little personal shift here? Um, uh, Doc would like to know what personally sustains you both in the face of adversity. Is there anything you'd like to share us all in these really, really challenging times? as long-term committed activists yourselves? <laughs> That's a very interesting and difficult question. Uh, but, you know, uh, before the pandemic, my favorite way to keep myself going, because I campaign a lot against uh, pollution by transnational corporations, especially in the oil sector. Uh, so what I used to do to keep myself going is to visit polluted spots uh, to remind myself that the job is not done. And so I just sit down for a few minutes, look at the polluted creeks. And um, and if you come to the United States, you find a hole, you can find a whole creek covered with crude oil. And corporations, both national and transnational, are totally responsible. Uh, and so you just sit down there, you know that, look, these guys must be held accountable for ecocide, for damaging nature in a way that is more or less irreversible. Uh, for killing the planet, killing when you kill a part of nature, you 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 are affecting the whole essence of of Mother Earth. And so, I think about how these guys can be held accountable anywhere and everywhere. Uh, but now, the lesson I've learned in the pandemic is that uh, really campaign for us to build movements and to get the grassroots to really rise up and do things does not really require uh, being at every location. That could be in fewer places, uh, but you can be more invisible than not visible, uh, and then allow actually those who are more impacted on a continuous and daily basis to speak up, show up, and, and be seen. Uh, and I, I found this very, very 
uh, empowering. Uh, so rather than say, oh, I couldn't go somewhere, I'm so disconnected, we are connected beyond physical connection. There's a spiritual level of connection, there's a social connection, and social distancing is something that we have to criticize and reject because when, when, when people promote that kind of distancing, then they're breaking the fabric of solidarity of people understanding one another. So we're finding more different ways of telling stories and telling stories uh, through the use of art, poetry, music. Uh, this is very, it, it builds, it keeps the, it keeps the, uh, the vision of what needs to be done, uh, makes it very immediate. And, you know, there, 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 there are many products coming out, there are many um, creative works coming out that really empower in terms of poetry, in terms of music, in terms of uh, other forms of art, even sculpture, uh, uh, that really reminds us and that look, there's this thing that needs to be done and that also gives us energy to press forward. So yeah, I mean, it's great you bring arts as a, a form of sustenance for you. Because Dot here is sort of pointing out the arts industry has suffered hugely in the UK and I'm sure elsewhere during the COVID crisis and there's been a lack of government support. I mean, would you agree then that art and culture has a huge role to play in social change, change making and engaging wider audiences? Absolutely, I don't see how else we can move, bring about social change without the arts. <laughs> I don't really see that. Uh, because every march on the street must, I mean, people said poetry is not sloganeering, but you need the words for music. All we are saying, you know, all of this, this, the songs give us, uh, uh, this, they, they, they give us the energy to march on the streets. Uh, they give us the, uh, the energy to come together, to join hands, to sing, and the, the mysticas and everything that we do. These are all expression, art expressions. And so we have to take charge of the art ourselves. Make art, not war, as somebody said. Make, make art by ourselves and de determine what kind of stories should be told and what should be, what kind of stories we want to share in our circles that would energize us to go on to do something. So absolutely, art is critical, a critical ingredient if anybody wants to destroy art, then you are struggling to destroy. And we need public funding. We need public funding for the arts. Um, you know, this this film is the second in um, in, in in a series. Maybe there'll be more. Um, but there was a, a film that we made a little more than a year ago called "Message from." This is "Message from the Future 2, as you saw. "A Message from the Future One" um, was uh, uh, with Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. And it was about the Green New Deal. And it was telling the story of how we won a Green New Deal um, uh, from an indeterminate point in the future. Um, but that project came out of uh, looking back at the original New Deal era in the 1930s during another moment of profound crisis, economic crisis, ecological crisis, surging fascism. Um, when there was also, there was a response in the United States, um, tremendously flawed, as we know, that in the original New Deal, farmers were among those excluded in part because uh, there, there was one of the ways that African Americans were excluded from the, from the original benefits of the original New Deal. But one of the bright lights of the original New Deal was this huge funding in the arts um, uh, and, and, and a recognition that artists are workers and that in a time of economic uh, desperation, then and now, artists are hurting. And, um, and so FDR treated artists like, like, wor like workers uh, um, of any other kind who needed to feed their families. Um, and there was this huge investment in theater, murals, um, uh, and, and art really weaving communities back together and, and a recognition that when you are in an economic depression, it isn't just an economic state, it is a psychological and spiritual state as well. And so we need, we need to uplift. Um, and, and, and art is one of the ways that we do that coming together. And maybe as we said in the film, maybe it needs to be outdoors to stay safe. Um, but that generally makes us happier too. Uh, and, and, you know, another way that, that, that people's spirits were, were, were lifted up with, was through this investment in uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, and planting more than 2 billion trees. That's the kind of thing we need in the face of the climate crisis. Um, 
So we can do this. It's really hard work. And this is what we wanted to show in the film is, you know, we don't do it unless we come together as movements. Um, and one of the things that I think was really exciting for, for us, um, and this relates to some of the other questions that I'm seeing come in, was, was how much willingness there was among these different movements that don't necessarily work together to unite behind this vision. And it's a reminder that we don't do that as much as we should, and even as much as we used to do as, 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 as social movements. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about, so they're the heyday of the world social movement. Um, and, and, you know, strangely, and this is the irony, I think, of our, of our intensely interconnected age, digital interconnected age, is that even though it is easier than ever before to communicate across borders, we aren't building the kinds of sort of sturdy international visions that our movement ancestors were able to do with 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 far fewer tools. Uh, so that I think should we we should take as a challenge. Yeah, Let, let's um, let's talk a little bit about uh, one key issue the film raises, which is the question of uh, reparations. You know, I mean, we've had five hundred years of colonialism and neo-colonialism and. You know the whole exploitation of other countries is for, for for me as a Briton and for other people in Europe and in the States as well. It's sort of deeply ingra ingrained into our culture and thinking. Um, I mean, but but you you rightly uh, uh, raise the, the the issue of reparations. And Olivia is asking, well, how do you what do you envisage these would look like? You know, what what would they look like within a country like the U.S. or or and what would they look like internationally? What is it you, you, your expectations would be there? <clears throat> uh, all right, I, I go first on this. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I really feel, you know, sometimes uh, I feel uh, really burdened by the fact that people who owe the debt don't want to pay the debt, and mm. they have the power. It's a, a lot of, there's a lot of uh, inequality in the world today that has made it uh, possible for some countries who ought to be paying uh, for all the, the, the thefts and all the degradation and all the exploitation that's gone on over the, over the, over the years. And they could just sort of uh, walk away from all kinds of responsibilities. Uh, in many ways, you see, you see some countries refusing to be accountable in the illegal terrain, the international criminal courts will be, will be responsible in terms of uh, multilateral uh, uh, discussions on how to tackle the global warming uh, for whatever is what uh, and and so uh, of course colonial exploitation that is still ongoing it hasn't stopped at all um uh, so, so the issue of reparation is very deep uh, and i remember in 2010 at the world people's summit on the rights of mother earth or climate change and the right of mother earth uh, one of one of the one of the one of the uh the outcomes was that there should be a payment or a recognition and payment of ecological debt and climate debt. Uh, and when you see the kind of colonial degradation through plantation agriculture, uh, destruction of destructive extraction of minerals and trashing of trashing of whole communities, uh, apart from trashing of labor, uh, somebody has to be held to account. Uh, we can't just fold our hands and say that is the past. The past, you know, when we look back at the past just like looking back at today from the future we should we cannot just wash our hands and say we have no responsibility uh, people some people say it's difficult to compute how much uh, this is what how much ecological damage is was how, how much the take job of the entire carbon budget is what destruction of agriculture this the kind of laws that have been made to hamstring uh, smallholder farmers who are feeding the world uh, somebody must be held to account, and rep reparation would be at different levels. One, to me, one would be to do the fair share of climate action. You don't have to. We're not asking for. Countries are not asking for charity. We're just asking for responsibility. Do your fair share. You take eighty percent of the carbon budget. You pay eighty percent of what is needed to build resiliency in vulnerable communities and territories. Pay for what is required. Let let that amount go to the Green Climate Fund pot and let it be democratically controlled and not given as charity or as whatever, as loans. It is something we are seeing 
uh, uh, in, in the face of the pandemic. The international financial institutions quickly uh, got together to say, well, for X and Y, Z countries, we're going to reschedule your debt payment. You can pay in two years or three years, not now. I mean, just a way of securing their funds. They are not. They are not relieving. They are not creating any kind of relief when nations are weakened by pandemics and by economic exploitation. And then you reshape the debt and wait for them. When they try to recover, you hit them again by the repayment. Mm -hmm. Then you give conditionalities, like our economy to destroy through the structural adjustment programs of the 1990s. So uh, all this needs to be halted. We need true justice in the world, and we can build this from the ground up. You know, not going to be built from the top up. You not know, the politicians who not build it. Citizens have to build it. It's got to get to a point where citizens assume the power that we have uh, and get the politicians to uh, and those who are elected to be servants, which they ought to be, which they are supposed to be. Uh, and then the reparations for climate damage, for ecological damage, for for slavery and for colonialism uh, should be should be computed and actually one way or the other paid. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. Very true. And we've we've only uh, got five minutes left, actually. So I, I'm going to move on to the question uh, that I think uh, everyone wants to know the answer to, which is uh, what what does this mean? You know, this message of hope. What does it mean for our work? What does it mean for uh, the Oxford Real Farming Conference community? Uh, are we doing enough? Can we do more? And what is it that that we as a community should do next to to realise the the vision that you're presenting? Yeah, we do have thoughts on that. Can you well, guide us? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just a guest here. I'm a guest in your house. So I, I, I think that's really a question for all of you. Um, we don't have to take any notice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I think as, as a guest, I, I would say, just say um, that, that the, I think your vision is clear. Um, and, and you are one of the movements that um, has not been afraid to lead with the alternatives, right? Um, uh, uh, that is, isn't just an opposition movement, but it is, it is a movement with a very clear vision of what farming should be, um, of what food justice and food security actually is. Um, but I don't think any of our movements win on our own. Right. And so the spirit of this project is really about how do we come together and stay together um, in common cause. And the idea is not that you have one big movement blob um, that erases all of the specificity and difference um, between movements, uh, um, but it is about coming together and and really feeling the strength that flows from that. Because, you know, coming back to another question around what sustains me and, and, and where my hope lies. Um, and I'm not hopeful all the time by any means. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I remind myself as somebody who has been in movement spaces for a quarter of a century now, uh, um, that that this that there are more people not just involved in movements than at any point in my lifetime, but um, more people who are hungry for systemic change, who understand that it isn't one thing that is broken, that that we are living in an era of system failure. And when I look at the young people who are part of the global student climate strikes, um, you know, or or the young people who were part of the Bernie Sanders campaign, um, which you know I had the pleasure of being a part of, and that was a huge political thrill, um, even if we didn't make it all the way. Um, they, that that there is not just there is a desire to break out of the silos, to use a farming metaphor. Um, and to and to really understand what the what what is the system that is producing all of these crises, whether it is our information, the crisis in our information system, our democracies, um, our food system, our labor system, it is failing on every front, right? Um, and and so and so yeah, so I would just say um, yes, do the work. On farming, but 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 also invest in the coalition work um, that is really about 
the a holistic vision of change. Um, we need we need your leadership, right? Because I think you have those institutions. You've invested in the institutions when so many movements actually haven't, right? Um, and you have an international movement, and I think the numbers that are you know have participated in this conference really speak to that. Um, so we just need you know more of you uh, and and um, and 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 more investments across in, in those in those cross movement spaces. But it is a very diverse movement. But you're saying there's strength in that diversity, and we can build on that. And that diversity is in itself a strength that can help to build a movement. You know, whether it's the farmers' process in India that you know it can be part of a larger international movement, or what's been going on in the USA or anywhere. I mean, well, you never lost your internationalism, and I think a lot of other a lot of movements did. Is the truth. Yeah. But I think we're really uh, just underlining it through this conference in a, in a really exciting way. Nibbe, what do you? What are your thoughts on this from Nigeria? Um, well, uh, I think we cannot do uh, without really joining hands and working together and building the future that we want and dreaming together. I saw a question about somebody asking who would tell the story. I think this is the duty that we have all of us must tell this story. And today we can tell one story each day. And one debt we have to one another is the debt of love. So let's love one another. Let's connect our hands together. Let's work together. Thank you. That's a, a, a beautiful point, I think, to, to leave it. Thank you very much for all your uh, inspiring and expansive, extensive thoughts. And also for the lovely film, I, I hope it really gets out to a wider and wider audience over the coming months. And, and some of all our visions are uh, become a reality. I'm sure, I'm sure that can happen. Um, so uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, uh, Naomi and, uh, and Nimmo will leave us now, uh, but do join us in the closing plenary, uh, which uh, I've got to hop over to now myself, uh, just for the um, last uh, 50 closing minutes of the conference and some beautiful uh, folk music as well, we'll be hearing to, to sing us out. So thank you again from all corners of the world and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.